disaster could take place in any form it could come as a tsunami a flood fires in buildings or a disastrous plane crash so disaster could actually take any form there are some disasters that are caused by climatic factors or geological factors and can be categorized as natural disasters while there are some disasters that take place due to human activities or are man induced and thus can be categorized as man made disasters so here tsunamis and floods that are caused by geological and climatic factors could be kept under the category of natural disasters while on the other hand plane crash fires in the buildings nuclear terrorism and many such other things that are caused due to human activities or are man induced can be categorized as man made disasters so disaster could be natural or man made we will take a look at some natural disasters and we'll understand how or what are the factors that lead to such natural disasters but before we do that we need to have a clear understanding of the difference between a hazard and a disaster so to define hazard we could say hazard is an event that has the potential to cause a threat to human life so any event that has the potential or the capability of causing a threat to human life is called a hazard now when this natural hazard increases its capability to cause severe damage to life and property it can turn into a disaster or it can be called as a disaster now such hazards that have the capacity or the potential to cause threat to human life when increases its capability to cause severe damage to life and property then they could take the form of a disaster or could be called a disaster so the potential of any hazard when increases to cause severe damage is called a disaster now for example the areas around a notorious river could be called a hazardous place when these rivers cause massive floods or flooding of the surrounding areas then it could be termed as a disaster which might cause damage to life and property and to cure such damage there will be a lot of time taken so areas near a notorious river could be called a hazardous place similarly people living in an area surrounded by nuclear power plant is also a hazardous area now in this hazardous area a nuclear accident or industrial accident that could lead to a release of harmful chemicals and harmful gases could also turn the place or invent becoming a disaster so a disaster is just an intensified version of any hazard So here we were talking about natural disasters. So natural disasters could be categorized into further two subtypes. It could be a rapid or sudden onset disaster or it could be a slow onset disaster. So what is the difference between the two? Well, a sudden or a rapid onset disaster refers to such situations that are triggered by hazardous events and they take place in a very short notice. so without any prior information or warning so these rapid onset disasters are triggered by hazardous events that emerge quickly and unexpectedly that is without any warning or without giving any time for preparation on the other hand we have slow onset disasters now slow onset disasters refers to those events that occur gradually over a certain period of time after a series of events now example of rapid or sudden onset disasters could be a volcanic eruption or an earthquake that does not give any that are not really predictable and can occur suddenly however a slow onset disaster example could be a flood 
or a cyclone now these could be tracked and people could be warned beforehand to be prepared for a flood or a cyclone so this was the difference between the two types of natural disasters that can cause severe damage to life and property earthquakes as i just mentioned are rapid or sudden onset disasters that is earthquakes can come suddenly without any warning and they cannot really be predicted earthquakes can cause some incurable damage that take a very long time to be recovered from the earthquakes tells us about the amount of energy that is present within the earth's crust the earth's crust is composed of slowly moving rocks called the tectonic plates now when these tectonic plates move against each other or slide against each other they detangle now when this happens there's a sudden jerk due to which the earth shakes so an earthquake can actually bring down an entire city in seconds that's a huge destruction now where the earthquake is strongest at the surface there it is called the epicenter from the epicenter waves of energy is distributed in the surrounding area volcanic eruptions are another natural disaster active volcanoes or dormant volcanoes could be found across the globe there are 1500 volcanoes on the earth surface countless of which are also on the ocean floor now these volcanoes are generally found on the boundaries of tectonic plates where they are continuously moving and a important example of that is the ring of fire where 75% of the earth's volcanoes could be found these volcanic eruptions can also lead to earthquakes earthquakes can lead to huge loss of life and property when the earth shakes weak buildings walls and bridges can collapse leading to incurable loss of life and other damages now curing from these or recovering from these damages can cost on both human and natural resources it is believed that every year around 10000 people die due to such earthquakes the numbers however has increased over the years and it's getting worse one of the deadliest form of such such earthquakes was experienced in Haiti a region around the caribbean sea and it is believed that around 300000 people died in this earthquake so now let us point out some of the major consequences of earthquakes now earthquakes could lead to a damage of roadways and railways that could obstruct our day to day life and can also cost human resources other than that this collapse of buildings and bridges as we saw in the previous video that can cause huge loss of property now due to the collapse of such infrastructure there could be huge damage to life as well people usually get buried under the debris of such collapses now we also saw in the previous videos that a lot of volcanoes are also present on the ocean floor so when volcanic eruptions occur of those volcanoes present on the ocean floor we also experience tsunamis and such tsunamis have a prolonged damaging effect on the nearby areas or on the areas through which they cross such tsunamis can also lead to devastating floods that can take days and days to be cured or recovered from other than tsunamis we also have fires in buildings because when the earth shakes during an earthquake then all the gas lines and electric lines get destroyed leading to the leakage of gas that can lead to fire in buildings and finally one of the most common consequences of an earthquake is a landslide now as you can see landslides could be major or minor which could obstruct our day to day life and it can also cause damage to the surrounding area so these were the consequences of an earthquake which is a natural disaster and these earthquakes definitely come without any warning and can be very very destructive so to have a better understanding of the earthquake we need to have a clear understanding of the seismic waves so seismic waves are waves of energy produced during an earthquake so these waves of energy are released from the focus within the earth's crust from where the earthquake had originated 
Now, right perpendicular to the focus on the surface of the Earth is the epicenter. Epicenter is the place where the earthquake is strongest on the Earth's surface. Right? So, from the focus, the seismic waves spread across the surrounding area and has a lasting effect on not only the place where it has occurred, but also on the surrounding region. Now, to detect or to measure the magnitude and intensity of the earthquake, we have a special instrument. This is called the seismograph. So, seismograph is an instrument used to detect and measure an earthquake. Now, the seismograph that is an instrument to measure and detect the earthquake uses a special scale called the Richter scale. So, the Richter scale is used to measure the magnitude or the energy released by an earthquake. However, another scale that is used in the measurement of an earthquake is the Merkley scale. But the working or the purpose of these two scales are different. While the Richter scale is used to measure the magnitude or the energy released during an earthquake, a Merkley scale is used to measure the intensity or the effects caused by the earthquake. So, this measures the magnitude while this measures the intensity. Now, the Richter scale was developed by Charles Francis Richter and the Merkley scale was developed by Giuseppe Merkley. Now, the calculations on the Richter scale is done by studying the seismograph the same instrument that we learnt about a while ago. While the Mercury scale that measures the intensity or the effects of an earthquake is done to measure, does that by observations. So, based on observations, we understand the intensity earthquake or the, or the after effects of an earthquake. Now, we also need to keep in mind that in a Richter scale, the numerical values are assigned from 0 0.0 to 10.0. On the Mercury scale, it is assigned in Roman numbers, that is from 1 to 12. Now, it is believed that if an earthquake has been assigned a value less than 7 on a Richter scale, it means that the damage is not that severe or the earthquake is not that severe. However, if the Richter scale counts for a numerical value of more than 7, then it means that the earthquake has been very, very devastating, causing severe damage. The numerical value of 7 or 6 on the Richter scale accounts for an 8 on the Mercury scale. So, these were the difference between the two types of scales that are used for measuring an earthquake. Now, there are certain things that we need to keep in mind in terms or in situations of an earthquake occurrence. Now, during an earthquake, if we have no access to immediate help from the disaster management team, then we need to keep certain small and easy steps in mind. Firstly, if there is an earthquake, you should immediately drop down and find cover. After you do that, you can hold on to the shelter that you have found. So, it could be a table or a nearby seat. So, if an earthquake occurs, you should immediately cover your head with your arms, find a cover and hold on to the shelter. During an earthquake, you should also keep yourself as calm as possible because as more you panic, the more problems will you create for yourself. So, the first thing that you need to keep in mind is to calm down. Now, if you are inside your home, then you need to stay away from certain things. That is, you need to stay away from lamps, windows and cupboards. But while you are outside on road, then you need to stay away from buildings, walls and also electric poles. Now, if you are in a public place, then you should immediately cover your head and find a shelter. And if someone is on a wheelchair, then he should immediately stop at a safe place, put on the brakes and cover his head with his arms. Finally, if you are 
driving or if you are inside a vehicle then you should find a safe place put on the brakes and stay inside the vehicle so these are simple steps that we could do or we could keep in mind during an earthquake before any help comes to save us or rescue us now a very important aspect while studying about earthquakes is about mapping earthquake prone zone this is also known as seismic zonation so seismic zonation is useful for hazard reduction why seismic zonation refers to the mapping of areas that are more or less prone to earthquakes now if we rightly map the areas that are more or less vulnerable to earthquakes then steps could be taken accordingly regarding our day to day activities and it could also help us to reduce the risk and intensity of an earthquake by designing earthquake resistant structures risk analysis and land use planning so activities like tourism construction of hotels buildings roadways and railways could be done accordingly after mapping the earthquake prone areas and people could also be made aware to be prepared for any such sudden earthquakes so here we see that this map tells us about the seismic zones of the country of india so places that are colored in deep red are places that are most vulnerable to earthquakes so we see that parts of assam and gujarat are highly vulnerable to earthquakes while certain parts like the deccan region and the central portion of the continent is least affected by earthquakes so in this way we could carry on with a wise administration of the resources and the distribution of population in any country so seismic zonation helps us in earthquake resistant design of structure structure of different buildings and different infrastructures now such earthquake resistant buildings are also equipped with certain important devices these devices are seismic dampening widgets also called base isolators no such devices are usually attached or are placed under the base of these earthquake resistant buildings and these devices reduces the intensity of an earthquake so when an earthquake occurs they help the buildings to move along with the direction of the earthquake so that damage could be kept at minimum so the spring motion of the building is reduced with the help of the installation of these devices so engineers should be very very careful in first understanding the areas that mostly requires such devices installing such devices in places that are least affected by earthquakes is definitely not a wise decision but after seismic zonation people could be more aware of places that are more vulnerable to such earthquakes and they can install such devices in such places and can protect people or save people from severe damages Japan being an island country is present at the juncture of some major earth tectonic plates now due to this Japan is believed to be one of those countries with the most active volcanoes now because of these active volcanoes they have very frequent earthquakes and they have come up with a very smart way of coping up with such earthquakes now since earthquakes occur so frequently there they cannot afford to rebuild their houses again and again and incur such huge losses therefore a smarter way of living is the building of soji screens now soji screens are foldable walls that are generally used as room dividers and they are built mostly of wooden materials which are filled with paper and clothes so such soji screens in japanese homes are made of papers so when an earthquake occurs and they get destroyed it does not lead to a wastage or destruction of huge human or natural resource now earthquakes as we just learned are rapid onset disaster that is they come without any warning right and they come unexpectedly however on the contrary we have other natural disasters like floods 
tsunamis and cyclones well these are slow onset disasters because they give us time to prepare ourselves for these disasters so floods are a slow onset disaster now a classic example of floods that tells us how devastating a flood can be is the story of noah's ark if you have read this story it is one of those stories that tells us how it rained for 40 days and 40 nights and caused huge damage to life property and even animals one of the major factors that leads to floods is heavy rainfall now the rain water that is a result of heavy rainfall takes some time to flow into the river channels and thus it leads to the flooding of the surrounding areas this overflow also leads to dam failure thus increasing the intensity of floods now deforestation is another factor that leads to floods deforestation in the name of urbanization leads to clearance of forest lands and this makes the soil more vulnerable to floods now other than that other factors may include an earthquake which leads to landslide and blockage of river channels leading to flooding of surrounding areas and careless handling of dams may also lead to dam failure leading to severe floods besides these silting of river beds and blocking of river channels by landslides as i mentioned are one of the major factors that can lead to floods so floods that are a slow onset disaster are a result of a number of factors now besides those factors some natural disasters like tsunamis and cyclones also can lead to floods and these have an incurable prolonged damage to life and property so those were a number of factors leading to floods now floods can cause huge damage to life and property as i've been mentioning but other than that it also leads to soil degradation and soil erosion and thus they affect agriculture and this generally affects the middle income group people who are largely dependent on the agricultural industry so floods that can cause huge damage to life and property can also lead to soil erosion and soil degradation that has a negative effect on agriculture and agricultural industry now floods besides those damages and economic loss also leads to the growth of waterborne diseases now waterborne diseases particularly diarrhea and jaundice most commonly occur during floods now jaundice as we know turns the eyes of the patient yellow and it has a bad effect on the liver making the person extremely sick on the other hand diarrhea too has a bad effect on the health of people suffering from the disease and there are certain symptoms that are easily visible during diarrhea and these symptoms may include abdominal pain and cramping irregular bowel movement fever and chills loose stool and nausea and bloating and vomiting so these are the frequent symptoms that we see during diarrhea now just like prevention could be done by seismic zonation of areas for an earthquake a similar thing could be done for flood prone areas so here are certain states marked as flood prone areas of the country of india now it is very important to map flood prone areas so that we can prepare ourselves for precautionary measures as we know precaution is always better than cure so people aware of the probable floods that could occur and also help them with precautionary measures is one of the best things that we could do to save ourselves from the severe damage of floods so the states in india that are most vulnerable to floods include kerala Andhra Pradesh, Odisha, West Bengal, Assam, Bihar, Uttar Pradesh, Delhi, Haryana, Punjab, Rajasthan and Gujarat. So as we see that most of them are around sea or ocean area and that is on the coastal regions and are highly prone to floods. 
Now, most of us here must have seen that in the beaches or in the coastal regions, the homes are generally built on stilts or pedestals. So as we can see, they are generally built at a certain height so that there is no flooding of apartments. However, such structures or infrastructures cannot help us from severe floods and can be used to stay protected during everyday routine. So there we learnt a lot about the two types of natural disasters. One is rapid or sudden onset disaster and the other one is slow onset disaster. We looked at how natural disasters could be categorized under these two headings with their distinct characteristics. While rapid onset disasters come without warning, the slow onset disasters could give us some time to prepare ourselves and take precautionary measures. Now, in any form of disaster, there are certain things that we need to keep in mind and be prepared with. One of those things is the 72-hour survival kit. So, while the disaster management team has not reached us during any disaster, these will definitely help us during any such event. Now, a 72-hour survival kit must include a whistle, clothes, flashlight, important documents, first aid kit, emergency money, ready to eat food, battery operated radio, cell phone and bottled water. So these are some of the things that you must be prepared with if you are living in a flood prone area or any disaster prone area. In our next lesson, we'll be taking a look at other natural disasters and see how they have a severe effect on life and property. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel and hit the bell icon. You can also register for free at deltastep.com or download the Delta Step app to learn one-to-one -one with our amazing teachers or to get access to all our 5,000 plus amazing videos as per your school syllabus. Master each topic with our adaptive practice technology. Get million plus questions with step-by-step -step solutions and unlimited mock test. Get all your doubts resolved instantly. Learn via games and win amazing prizes like playstations and iPads. So at Delta Step, learning is not just fun and easy, it is rewarding too. So register for free now.